Uh, welcome. My name is Susan Rothschild. I'm president of the Shandela Land Trust. And this is our, hard to believe, but 22nd winter lecture. We always, it's always been in February, because we consider February kind of the doldrums of uh, winter. But uh, obviously, of necessity, it had to be, it had to be in March. Um, Anyway, I wanted to thank you all for coming and um, thank the Food Committee, who, as always, has done an amazing job. And after the talk, please help yourself. We've got savory, we've got sweet, we've got coffee, and we've got tea. Um, so I, I did want to say that if, if, if you got the postcard, which was a terrific postcard, um, and uh, you saw on one side was the uh, inf information about the lecture today. On the other side was a thank you. Um, we are so grateful to our donors. Um, we had a $100,000 challenge to um, finish the Bataki farm and the Riverleaf farm. And with that $100,000, which, by the way, we met, thank you, thank you, um, to all of you, uh, we then were able to get the $200,000 of a grant. Um, uh, and it really has made a, an enormous difference, so we're very appreciative. Um, and without much, I think, Kathy, have I settled? Is that everything I need? Okay. Then I'm going to introduce Kathy, who's going to then introduce our panelists for today. So first, if at any time you can't hear anybody, raise a hand or something so that we know to adjust things. Uh, so we are incredibly fortunate uh, here in Sheffield that we have such a spectacular landscape, uh, which is uh, both ecologically, agriculturally, and it's an intact uh, landscape where people are such a part of it. And so today, um, we usually talk about agricultural preservation restrictions, conservation restrictions, but there are these lesser known tools that we all have to be able to help uh, protect this amazing area for the wildlife, for the natural landscape, and for the people. And um, Leslie Dechonic and Shep Evans are uh, incredibly knowledgeable about, um, Leslie's gonna be talking about the Area Critical Environmental Concern Program and Shep about the Scenic Mountain Act. And these are both things that, uh, that, that individuals and communities can use without necessarily partnering with a nonprofit like the Land Trust. This is as people are, you know, just going about their everyday business on their property. You know, as they're thinking about, you know, do I want to put up a shed? Do I want to expand? What do I want to do with my landscaping? These are really important. Um, they're really important decisions that landowners make every day. And so um, we're going to hear about these pieces. Now, Leslie, um, Leslie used to run the Every Critical Environmental Concern program for the state of Massachusetts. He also uh, ran the Nature Conservancy's uh, Western Massachusetts program uh, for a long time and is intimately uh, knowledgeable about Sheffield and the Schnabrick area of critical environmental concern. Uh, Shep Evans is currently the conservation agent for Great Barrington but he has also been uh, a member of, on the board of the uh, Stockbridge Land Trust for 30 years. He's been incredibly involved with conservation commissions, um, both in Stockbridge and at the state level, and is a wealth of knowledge. Both of them are just an incredible wealth of knowledge and practical down-to-earth folks. So I will turn this over to Leslie, who's gonna start by talking about the Arab Critical Environmental Concern Program. Everybody can hear me okay? Yeah. Well, first of all, it's wonderful to be back in Berkshire's. Uh, I live in the Connecticut River Valley in a little town called Shootsbury. 
but I've worked and spent a lot of time here in Sheffield and Southern Berkshire, so it's always a delight and a pleasure to be here. I'd like to thank Kathy and the board for inviting me to talk with you today and for the opportunity to bring back many, many fond memories of this beautiful part of the world. So uh, the, the title of my talk is An Area of Critical Environmental Concern is what? <laughs> and then the little bylines are, 30 years ago, Schnabrook in the southern part of Sheffield was designated an area of critical environmental concern by the state of Massachusetts. So the question was, what critical environmental concerns were going on in Sheffield and Mount Washington in 1990? And what did and what does it mean to have an ACEC in your backyard? And I think as uh, was mentioned in the program, I was the director of the ACEC program for 15 years, from 1989 to 2004. I had a really good run and I loved running that program. I left it 16 years ago. So the fact that the Schnabrook ACEC was designated in 1990, 30 years ago, and I left the ACEC program 16 years ago, I'm gonna be calling upon some help from you all here in the audience, both on both counts. Relative to conservation tools, I think it's really important that people have an understanding of history and why and how conservation tool was developed and implemented. So I'm going to be talking about, well, what was going on in 1990. So in 1990, Michael Dukakis was the governor. How many people remember? <laughs> okay. In 1990, he was coming off a loss in the 1988 presidential election. He left office in 1991, but not before coming to Sheffield to help celebrate the designation of the Schnabel ACEC. But I'm getting a little bit ahead of my story. Let me go back a little bit more. Although the first ACEC was designated in 1975, 1975, the program was authorized, regulations, the first designation, 1975, and several had been designated prior to 1990. At that time, no ACEC had ever been nominated west of Westboro. How many people know where Westboro is? <laughs> Westboro is east somewhere. <laughs> so around 1989, 1990, I was contacted by Nancy Smith and Susanna Lee about their interest in preparing an ACEC nomination for a strong group. And based upon what they had told me, what I had learned about the area, I was very eager to do a, a site visit. And a site visit, quote unquote, in the parlance of, of the job. Uh, anybody who works in environmental stuff, if they spend a lot of time in the office, they love doing site visits. So this site visit was arranged, and it was the winter, 1989, 1990. It was very cold, snow, ice, and I was the state official coming out from Boston to meet with the local people about something they were interested in. So I was guided around in a car and shown this and that, the other thing, this state official. And at one point, we stopped on Kelsey Road, right where it crosses Dry Brook. Everybody know that particular part of town? From that particular place, you see the fen, you see the wetlands, north and south. You look to the west, you see the Taconics. It's one of the most breathtaking places to be and to hang out in Sheffield. And we are out of the car, and there was something that drew my interest, you know, up along the brook. So I started walking on the ice. You know where this is going? <laughs> so here is this erstwhile state official, you know, leaving the pack and walking in the ice, and, and he fell through the ice. 
up to here. <laughs> Fortunately, he somehow or another spread eagle, so he didn't fall completely, and he somehow extricated himself, went back to the car, totally, totally, totally humiliated, as you can imagine. <laughs> and the kind of folks from Sheffield took him back to sit in front of the fireplace and gave him some warm clothes and didn't um, embarrass him too much any further than he'd already embarrassed himself. And that was my first uh, encounter, you know, with the particular waters of Sheffield. <laughs> Anybody recall that particular site visit? So this is a story that I just revealed to people who really don't know about that story. Okay, well, so hopefully that's to break the ice, that I'm no longer an official from Boston, and I, I have liberty to tell a few stories while I'm up here. So February 28th, 1990, virtually 30 years ago today, the nomination was submitted by 10 citizens from Sheffield in Mount Washington. Um, Susanna and Nancy were, I think, the leaders of that. Anybody here in this audience who were among those 10 citizens who helped, who signed that particular petition? Well, what they did, we got 10 citizens are eligible to submit an ACEC nomination. And they had solicited a lot of support from nonprofits, from town boards. What happens when an ACEC nomination is submitted to the Secretary of Boston? The staff reviews it and says, well, does this qualify initially as a potential area of critical environmental concern? And it did. So what happens then is a series of information meetings and public hearing. And actually, I was in a public information meeting here. 30 years ago, as well as up in Mount Washington. And that public information campaign culminated in a public hearing. So after this formal comprehensive review, and we can talk about that later if you're interested, then Environmental Affairs Secretary John DeVillers signed a designation document. It was announced in the press release and in several phone calls to local citizens and legislators. And then later that summer, in a gathering celebrating the ACEC designation, it was held in a, in a field overlooking the Fen in that Smith's land. And guess who showed up to participate in that celebration? Michael Dukakis. How many times have you all seen Michael Dukakis in the site visit here? Here in Sheffield. So there you go. That's how important it, it seemed to be to a variety of people at the time. So, for those of you who can kind of date back to 1990, do you have any particular recollections of what was going on environmentally in Sheffield or Mount Washington at that time? Yeah. Yes, please. I lived on Salisbury Road, and I, I had just sort of gotten involved with the land trust, which represents the Sheffield Land Trust, and Nancy called and asked if I would do some soliciting in the neighborhood. And most people were wonderful, were a few who wanted to know what what that would do and why and how it would affect their properties. But I know that there were lots of things going on. And um, the, um, I Can everybody hear her? Because I think this is important. Could you please stand if you don't mind? Because you can hear from me, but it's important to hear from uh, your fellow uh, yes. citizens here. So, Hello. Yeah. Um, I, um, so I, in 1990, we had been here quite a long time, actually, and we had been threatened by New England power plant that wanted to build this um, facility up on the mountain. So we became very aware of how important this area is. And um, Nancy called me and asked if I would do some soliciting or canvassing our neighborhood, which is Salisbury Road, and the Schnabrook is right, runs right through our property, and, and lots of our friends that live there. 
And um, so I, um, I got very involved with it, and I was there when Dukakis came. I have photos from that, <laughs> from that um, ceremony. And it was very exciting, even though I uh, wish, I always wish that um, the ACEC was a law and not just, you know, whatever. It's called. We'll talk about that yeah. a little bit, okay. Okay. <laughs> what, what it means from a, from a... I, I, I have a very, I don't know, I always feel that I should have been more um, aggressive when we were um, trying to get people interested in the ACEC. And I always regretted that my name wasn't on that sheet because I know everybody that was on there. But <laughs> I was I was sort of green, quote unquote, at that moment. But it was fun. It was and Nancy, I'm sorry she's not here today because she was such a and and, and um Susanna. And Susanna also. Yeah. Yes, but Thank I, you. Yeah, it was fun. This this is the nomination book that was submitted uh, for the nomination, which was submitted to my office and submitted to the secretary. And there are a couple of copies there. And the, the 10 people who were citizens uh, who were signed the nomination paper that were submitted are listed on the inside of this book. Um, citizens both from Sheffield and from Mount Washington, thank you very much. One of the things that I was highly aware of at the time and shortly thereafter was how active the Nature Conservancy was in this particular area. They had targeted this area, Sheffield, Egremont, actually Campusabog in Stockbridge, um, because of the high, high significance of the rare species habitat and the numbers of rare species. So I know that that was a, a lot of what spurred the, uh, the nomination. And the Nature Conservancy was strongly supportive. So, Schnabrook covers seven, over 17,000 acres. Covers over, over 10,000 acres in Sheffield, over 3,000 acres in Mount Washington. It met all of the listed, there are nine criteria listed in the ACC regulations. Uh, and for an area to qualify, it just needs four or five. But all of them, scenic areas, wetlands, rare species habitat, uh, water supply areas, um, met all those criteria. And in the nomination document, in, in the final designation document, we had counted through the Natural Heritage Program, there are over 40 state listed rare species within the Schnaubrook ACEC. Um, currently, and I had a chance to talk with the current director of the ACEC program, Nancy Putnam, whose name is referred to on the resources uh, for your program. Um, she gave a presentation a couple months ago in, in November, and I kind of looked at that presentation. I said, Nancy, help me do a little bit of catch up. It's been 16 years since I was running the program. Uh, so she kindly provided me uh, with a copy of the slideshow that she had presented to the people who were here at the time. And what's interesting is that particular slideshow said there were 28 state listed rare species rather than the 40 that we had uh, derived with natural heritage. So there's a piece of homework that somebody needs to do to follow up and kind of say, hey Nancy, how do you reconcile what has happened? And she's a good person for that because she's a trained ecologist. But the 28 state listed rare species, five priority natural communities. Most towns don't have any, but to have five priority natural communities and over 11,000 acres of what's referred to as biomap core habitat. 11,000 acres, 11,000 acres priority habitat. That just gives you an idea that we're just not talking the wetlands themselves or the stream corridors. We're talking about 11,000 acres. Adjacent to the Schnabrook ACEC is the Carner Brook ACEC, which was designated two years later. And it also met all the criteria and the regulations for qualification and for review. It has 5,700 acres in Egremont, uh, in 
I'm sorry, it has 5,000 acres in this state listed biomedical habitat. And according to Nancy's data, includes 59 state listed rare species and priority natural communities. And I'm happy to say, and I'm honored and pleased that she's here, one of the 10 nominators for that um, Carnegie Birth ACEC nomination is with us today. Uh, Ursula, please raise your hand. Thank you. <laughs> and if any of you have really been involved in an intensive campaign, talking to neighbors, and, and, and there's something that you're advocating for and trying to get community support. Uh, you may have an idea, but having been the director of the program and lived through several ACEC nominations submitted by people from around the state, it's an arduous process. And the people who are the nominators, be they individuals or, or town boards, you know, really are courageous people. They're saying, this is important, and we're going to stand up for this. So that's a little bit of history. Since the Schnabrook AC was designated, there are four other ACECs that have been designated in the Berkshires. As I mentioned, prior to Schnabrook in 1990, there were none. Carter Brook was designated in 1992. Insdale Flats, 1992. Part of that nomination was submitted in response to this huge mega landfill that's provide, that was proposed on the slopes uh, leading down to the east branch of the Housatonic River, also in rare species habitat, da, 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 da. Um, and uh, relative to Neil's question, uh, siting a new solid waste facility is not allowed within an ACEC. So the impetus for that particular ACEC nomination and ultimate designation was the proposed siting and discussion of this particular uh, large landfill from somebody from out of state. And once that ACEC was designated by then Environmental Secretary Sue Tierney, the solid waste siting process was stopped in its tracks. So as of now, 30 years, 28 years later, there is no huge mega landfill on the slopes in Mount in, in Hinsdale leading down to these branch of the Rusatani. Camp Houston was designated in 1995 and the upper Housatonic River in 2009. So since that time there are positive developments that, that I'm, I'm aware of is there's been some amount of greater appreciation and knowledge and understanding of these ACPCs and their critical resources. There have been positive state agency actions. I recall, I think it was in the 1990s, Thomas Sheffield had applied for an economic development grant related to tourism, and it being one of the last great places identified by the Nature Conservancy. I think it was a $10,000 grant that was awarded to the town. There have been various local and state environmental reviews with the intention of minimizing or avoiding adverse impacts. And then the other piece, I'm going to get back to this, is that there's been pro active environmental stewardship. And Nature Conservancy is still here in Chapel, Egremont, Mount Washington, and other communities in Western Mass. And a couple of projects that they have, just to give you an idea of what stewardship can mean, is that the Nature Conservancy is collaborating with Department of State Fisheries and Wildlife on restoration and management of rare species and rare species habitat, ongoing with some habitat increases and in expansion and one huge population recovery. The, the, the point is, is that it's not necessarily a zero sum or losing struggle in terms of trying to manage our habitat and our important places. Nature Conservancy is also working developing a white paper to analyze and understand the resiliency of the Schnabrook watershed and their preserve to climate change and to see how resilient these ecosystems are, what this one is, what makes it resilient, and what might be done better or different to preserve or enhance that resiliency. And that's a game that we're all in together, wherever we happen to live. How can we improve, maintain, improve the resiliency of our communities and the natural habitats that surround us? 
I'm curious, I wanted to ask, since I've not been active from an ACEC perspective uh, for many years, does anyone here know of any other particular positive examples of what has taken place because of the ACEC designation here in town or in Mount Washington? I'll give you one, and I'll look right at Eleanor Tillinghast. Is is there was a project proposed up in Mount Washington uh, by the state, by a state agency, and because it was a state agency acting within the area of critical environmental concern, it required a review by the Massachusetts Environmental Policy Act, which otherwise would not necessarily have been required. So what happened in the course of that quote NEPA review, the state was beholden to really show what is what it was proposing, why, and how it may or may not affect the environment. Which I'm saying because that's an example of a public review that two things it does. It requires a state agency, it puts them on notice, but it, it creates a more equal playing ground between the state, state agencies, what they want to do, and local communities. Because they need to review residents and town boards have an opportunity to comment. But this is baloney, or you're not, you could minimize or avoid the impacts in such and such a way that maybe were overlooked by the state agency initially. So that's one of the examples that uh, having an area of critical environment, how that can work for communities. <coughs> So what I'm going to do is give a very brief overview and background of the program itself. I've done it a little bit. The ACEC program was established in 1975. And part of the reason I wanted to give this history is that having a tool, conservation tools for protecting your neighborhood, means understanding what the tool is about, why it was proposed, and how you can work with it. So in 1975, ACC program was established by the state legislature, which again authorized the Secretary of Environmental Affairs identify, designate areas of critical environmental concern to the Commonwealth, and develop policies for acquisition, protection, and use. And ACEC regulations were then promulgated, which provide for the process of nomination designation. And with this directive, to state agencies, develop policies for protection and use. So subsequent to that enabling legislation, two agencies principally created regulations to address areas of critical environmental concern. As I mentioned, the MEPA map. So if a state agency or a state permit is triggered, it recalls within an ACEC, it requires this NEPA review, which allows for a, a, a broader opportunity to comment on the proposed project. DEP, Department of Environmental Protection, also has three sets of regulations that also include um, stipulations regarding ACECs. One is the solid waste regulations, siting regulations, which I mentioned before in the case of Hinsdale. Uh, there's another one that's a little bit more esoteric regarding uh, 301 certification, which has to do with wetlands and water quality. And then the other one, which is along with the NEPA, but the other one is the wetlands protection regs, which is the arena where the ACEC may or may not come into play more frequently. And the wetland regulations provide a higher threshold for impacts on wetlands within an ACEC, which is to say, if you want to come and alter boring vegetated wetlands, you have to comply with very specific conditions stipulated by the Conservation Commission. And the Conservation Commission must be mindful of the sensitivity and importance of the wetlands that somebody is proposing to act in. It doesn't mean you don't, can't necessarily work with them, but you need to follow very specific stipulations in going before the Conservation Commission. Don, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, no, I, I'm, I'm learning a lot here, Leslie. Keep it going. <laughs> 
Okay. <laughs> yeah. You want another piece, which is you can't have a hazardous waste dump, which is a separate set of regulations. Yes. Thank you. Which is germane and very much to the point. Uh, Eleanor has been very active in the nomination, subsequent designation of the Upper Housatonic River ACEC, of which many of you are familiar with and you should be familiar with. And, and the disposal of hazardous waste has been a very contentious issue. And the existence of that area of critical environmental concern has really raised the bar in terms of what happens with the disposal, well, the actual mitigation and disposal of that hazardous waste. Would you like to add anything? There's a lot to say, but I'll just say very briefly that the, um, the ACEC was nominated for the purpose of preventing a hazardous waste dump within that area. It was designated. The EPA agreed that no hazardous waste dump could be cited in the ACEC. The agreement that's now been negotiated would overturn the ACEC protection and allow a hazardous waste dump within the ACEC. So it's an interesting issue that I've suddenly gotten very involved in again. Yes, and, 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 and to it, part of the issue there, and correct me if I'm wrong, has to do with the relative jurisdiction of the federal government versus the state government. Yes. And the in, in, in involvement of a multi, 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 multi millionaire company. So, that's, so stay tuned to that, please. Yes, sir. When you talk about ACDC and the MIPA evaluation, what triggers a MIPA evaluation within an ACDC? What triggers a MEPA evaluation is if a state agency proposes an action, uh, if they want to uh, repay Route 41, you know, and, and there is particular financial improvements involved that they're supposed to file with MEPA and essentially saying, this is what we're gonna do, this is how we're protecting stormwater runoff so it doesn't foul the adjacent wetlands. So that's an initial MEPA review. Um, everybody has a chance to comment on it. It's noticed the environmental monitor, so people who are diligent in your town may get a copy of the environmental monitor You know when it comes out every two weeks or so. Two weeks these days? Okay, let's just say two weeks. It comes in two weeks, thank you. Um, if once, as the example of Mount Washington, once an area of a project goes into MEPA proposed by the state, um, there's a public discussion, and in a way, the state agency is almost pressured because if, if they don't want to have an environmental impact report, which is a big deal required by the state, then they really need to listen carefully to the comments and that they indeed are doing everything that can be done to avoid or minimize adverse impacts. There are state permits, uh, not necessarily in order of conditions from the Conservation Commission, but if an order of conditions is appealed, it's a state permit, it goes to the state, then that particular appeal requires a MEPA review. So those are the two obvious examples. Well, I was thinking too, because most of the issues around here are not the state coming and doing stuff, but it's more private individuals on properties. And I know that from a, when I was in industry, there was a part, there was a financial threshold that if we went over, if we did an expansion and we went over a certain monetary amount, that triggered a MEPA evaluation. Right. So I was wondering if there was a similar thing for, a, for the ACECs. <coughs> private individuals start working on their property. What does trigger a MEPA evaluation, that extra layer of protection? Well, there, there is a, a, a financial threshold. And again, I'm not familiar with that right now, current day, because it's been 16 years. Um, the, the most, okay, let me 
back off. And and I I need to finish before too long because it's my <laughs> time to, to yield to Chef. But we have questions and answers. Yeah, there will be a question and answer period afterwards. Um, I can answer that. Go for it. Okay. So just there are um, if you ha are a private individual, I serve on the Environmental Review Committee of the Berkshire Regional Planning Commission, and we review these projects. So if you have a rare or endangered species, a same species on your property, if there are certain um, characteristics that would require a, uh, a review, then but you're, there's no financial uh, demarcation for a private landowner. So, and, and there's some other things, but a, a landowner, a private landowner is not held to the same standards as the state or is uh, a corporation that would be working in a larger area. And I'm sure Chef could answer this as well because he certainly would be dealing with these issues. Thank you. Um, what, what's interesting, and I'm just going to finish with two thoughts, is, is this is what I said repeatedly during the 15 years that I was with the ACC program. Most of the activities that go on are only subject to local jurisdiction. You need a permit from the Board of Health, you go to the Board of Health and get a permit. You need a review from the Planning Board, ZBA, you need a building permit. From the, those are not necessarily affected by an ACEC designation. And those amount of development activities or household activities are what, 95 to 98% of the activities that go on. So generally, an ACEC designation in terms of its regulatory impact won't have that much. In some ways, it will protect against the home run. You can't site a solid waste facility. You can't site a large facility subject to MEPA review that would be clearly result in um, damage, unalterable damage to the, uh, to the environment. But this is where it falls upon people understanding how important the resources of their community are. So I'm just going to conclude with a little excerpt that I clipped from the ACEC Guide to State Regulations and Programs. It's just like a 14-page handout. Uh, it looked pretty familiar. I think I may have drafted the first one. Uh, but it was updated in 2017. Um, and and this, is, this is a whole 14-page piece that's talking about state regulations. And there's a lot of detail there. So I suggest, you know, if you're interested in more, go to the ACC program website that's listed. Okay, quote, the purpose of ACEC designation, the long-term preservation, management, and stewardship of critical resources and ecosystems cannot be accomplished through state regulations or programs alone. The stewardship of these resources is a responsibility shared by all citizens. From a practical perspective, the goals of ACEC designation can be achieved only through cooperative and collaborative efforts involving all of us. Private, public organizations, governmental agencies, local officials, civic environmental organizations, and residents of the communities. That's what I worked 15 years for in that particular program. And the, the, the legacy at this point in time is, is yours to continue. And again, you know, there are people that you can contact and work with. You can contact the AC, current ACEC program director, Angela Sarai Patel, the current Western Mass Stewardship Manager uh, with an office in Great Barrington, is doing great work in terms of stewardship. Um, Sheffield Land Trust is doing wonderful work in terms of protecting critical areas. Um, but I, I think there's a lot more that can be done. I mean, the Campus and Bog, Judy Spencer uh, helped prepare that nomination and the ultimate designation. And there is a Campus and Stewardship Committee that would meet every two or three months with representatives from Mass Department of Transportation, the Regional Planning Agency, Conservation Commission, volunteers, ACEC program staff, um, to educate and, and deal with flooding, to try to hustle resources for invasive species management. Um, they, they did this on a proactive volunteer basis. So there's a lot that can be done. 
probably not so much that one can do by oneself, but don't, don't uh, take me in my word for that, but generally in a group, generally in collaboration. Um, so I encourage you to invite Nancy back. She can talk in more detail about the effects of NECC designation. There are only about 12 people who came to her talk in November. She's a great slideshow, so think about that. And uh, with that, I'm going to uh, hand the podium over to Shep. connection between the mountains, the valleys, the streams, the water, and so as was so well illustrated by that quote, everybody's actions affect everybody else's actions, and so that's kind of what you're seeing in these slides that are going behind the, 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 the speaking, is everything is going up on the mountains, is, is oh, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> Everything that happens up there has an impact down below, and what you do you know, has an impact on your neighbor. And the ACEC program and then the Scenic Mountain Act that Chef's going to be talking about are a great way of helping neighbors to understand that these are all common resources and that it's important to be thinking about how what you're doing will affect you and everybody around you. So uh, a question was asked to reiterate what the ACEC stands for. It's an area of critical environmental concern. Okay. So yes. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for inviting me to participate in your meeting. Uh, my name is Shep Evans. Uh, I am currently the conservation agent for the town of Great Barrington and the town of Richmond. Um, long time member of the board, one time president of the Stockbridge Land Trust. Um, been involved in conservation things from, it seems like from the beginning of time. <laughs> um, uh, I sat on the um, ACEC Stewardship Committee in Stockbridge when I was chairman of the Conservation Commission there, uh, of the ACEC Stewardship Committee with Les Luchonic <laughs> was, was uh, on that. Uh, and it brought together an extraordinary, extraordinary cross-section of stakeholders and interested parties. Everything from the technical gas line pipeline people to the mass turnpike to the local conservation commission to the highway department to, uh, to the Nature Conservancy. I mean, extraordinary uh, diverse group that collaboratively, believe it or not, we're all able to work with each other and come up with a stewardship plan for the Campusa ACEC. It was extra a, a remarkable experience in all of my work in conservation. I, I, I don't, cannot remember another that is like it really. And it illustrated for me in big bold letters the virtues of collaborative effort. It really makes a difference. Anyway. Scenic Mountains Act, uh, that is the popular name for a piece of legislation which was written originally, passed into law, signed by the governor in the 1970s. If you think back, just as Les did, think back what was going on in the 1970s, you may recall a thing called the Clean Water Act and the Clean Air Act. There was a significant wave of interest and legislation federally and at the state level and so forth in environmental legislation and regulation. And an awareness that if we didn't take care of it, it wasn't going to be there for our children and our grandchildren. And uh, the Scenic Mountains Act was symptomatic as was the Weapons Protection Act, which you've heard about and probably know about, that was symptomatic of what was going on in those days uh, legislatively at the federal and state level. Uh, 
Scenic Mountains Act was the brainchild of a fellow by the name of George Wislocki. Could I see hands of anybody in the room that knows George Wislocki? Uh, George was the one time uh, sole proprietor, <laughs> founder, if you will, of an organization called the um, uh, Berkshire Natural Resources Council, which is the grandparent, I, in my way of thinking, the grandparent of all the local community land trusts here about. Uh, it is the premier land conservation organization of scale in uh, Berkshire County. Uh, thousands and thousands and thousands. You all conserve a lot of land, but Berkshire Natural Resources Council goes, almost adds another zero onto that. Um, really huge. And uh, George has since retired, uh, but the organization is much bigger and lives and is very busy now. Anyway, George had the insight and understanding to reach out uh, and pull together what I think of as the old guard in the world of land conservation and environmental efforts here in Berkshire County, the likes of George Mislocki, <laughs> Jidge Derry, who was the chairman of the Board of Fisheries and Wildlife in Massachusetts, Warren Archie, who was, he's now retired, was the state forester for the whole of Massachusetts, uh, and a whole other group of people like that. I think of uh, probably Sally Bell, who's an attorney in Lee, who did most of the legal work for all of those people, and uh, the town of Stockbridge, where I was, and undoubtedly did some work for the Nature Conservancy and others as well. Uh, and uh, he went and hired a, a legal Scrivener to draft uh, legislation which became the Scenic Mountains Act. It was passed unanimously into law in 1974-75. It was brought to town meetings. It was written for Berkshire County only uh, because Berkshire County represented the <laughs> The, the repository, the location of substantial scenic hillsides, fully forested scenic hillsides, uh, and beautiful green valleys uh, compared to the eastern part of the state. And the thought was that uh, if we didn't take care of it, it wasn't going to stay that way because if you've ever gotten on the turnpike and headed west, as you leave Massachusetts and pass into New York State, I still, I can see it in my sleep. Uh, I, you, you look up at the hilltops as you arrive in New York State and you will see plate glass windows staring down at you. Uh, that was something that I think a lot of people wanted to try to avoid. Uh, once upon a time, I lived in uh, East Bay, San Francisco, in the Oakland Hills. And if any of you have spent any time in that part of the world, you know what the uh, residential hillsides of San Francisco Bay look like. Well, given, given no regulation, given uh, free reign, uh, everybody wants to have a great view. And if you stack them up one on top of another, you end up with a whole hillside of great glass windows looking for you. Uh, so that was. Everybody was very aware that that was something that we really didn't want to have. Uh, so the, the law was written, it was passed, it was signed into law by Governor Sargent, uh, and uh, was presented to towns here in Berkshire County uh, to adopt. The act is a written for Berkshire County, as I said, to be in act, to be adopted at town meeting, town by town around, town by town, and implemented, put into effect, if you will, by the Conservation Commission of each town. Uh, there was a long list of towns that uh, signed on. Everybody was very enthusiastic. 
Uh, Sheffield was one of them. Stockbridge, Great Barrington, Richmond, Lennox, lots of towns. Uh, implementing, writing the regulations, drawing the map that shows the scenic mountain areas of town that are protected and where these regulations, these new regulations might apply. It was another enterprise entirely and no one really had any, any idea of how to go about doing that. There was some ideas, there was help available from the Regional Planning Commission, although they had never done it before either, and there were some provisions in the Act, uh, the law, which um, were hard for lay people to contemplate. Understand, the Conservation Commission is the implementer of the wetlands protection regulations. Lay people, volunteers, appointees, your friends and neighbors, uh, who are challenged with defining what is steep slopes and hilltops uh, and writing regulations to protect those things in perpetuity. And what do we mean by protection while we're at that subject, by the way? Uh, so, a big challenge. The Scenic Mountain Act empowers the commission to draft regulations to do two things, really. One is to protect what are called together watershed values. Uh, imagine, if you will, on the sides of all the hills around you here, on the other side of the valley and back here to the west, uh, steep slopes. We all know what they look like. If you've ever tried walking up some of those steep slopes, you know what steep is. Uh, and when we have one of those uh, really violent rainstorms that we have in the summertime sometimes, uh, and the amount of water that comes down off that mountain, you see, you've seen what happens, you've seen what floods. Uh, imagine if people were uh, turned loose to just sort of punch, get the bulldozer and put a driveway up the side of the hill to a place where I want to put a house up there and so forth. And, and, and with minimal supervision or minimal regulation about stormwater management, imagine what the end result would be. Uh, we've seen examples of it. Uh, and so to protect against serious erosion and sedimentation of streams, existing streams and rivers, uh, those watershed values, that's what that's all about. And to protect the aesthetic viewshed, the, 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 the view of these lovely green hills around us, which was generally recognized to be an amenity. Anybody that has come here to the Berkshires and has fallen in love with this part of the country understands what it is to have those lovely green hills around you. And that becomes in the thinking process and the regulatory process a public good. Something to be treasured, something to be protected. The view shed. The fully vegetated, forested, green hills, steep slopes, and hilltops. Well, it's an interesting challenge if I chose a small group of you, a half a dozen of you or so, and challenged you to go out in the world and define what is a steep slope and what is a hilltop, uh, you, you would quickly find that while you think you know where, what it is and where it is, if you go try to find it on the ground, it, the def, define, defining it is not quite so simple. Much less writing regulations to protect it and then enforcing those regulations when, of course, everybody coming through the door wants to put their house up in a place like that, and they want you, and they want to get the driveway up there. And no, I don't want to spend all that money putting stormwater systems in one side of my driveway, and on and on and on. So it's, it's a complicated process. The end result, the, the objective, is to preserve the aesthetics 
of the veggie, the fully forested steep slopes and hilltops. However, I want to I want to go on from there, having spoken about what the objective is. I want to go on and explain why there are very few, if any, prohibitions in a set of regulations under the Scenic Mountains. <coughs> Should be very few prohibitions. Uh, the reason being that the Scenic Mountains Act and the body that was appointed to implement it, being the Conservation Commission, was created in the context of a forerunner to it, which was the Wetlands Protection Act. The Wetlands Protection Act has very few prohibitions in it. What it does provide for, and the Scenic Mountain Act provides for, is pre-construction review and conditioning. That's what it's called. Pre-construction review and conditioning by a body that is trained volunteers who know, have performance standards that they want to meet and they want to find a what amounts to a negotiated solution to achieve most of what you, the applicant, might want to achieve while simultaneously protecting the interests that the Act is protecting, whether it's the Weapons Protection Act or the Scenic Mountains Act. And so if you have had any connection with the Conservation Commission in your ownership of property here in, in Sheffield, uh, you know that their concern is uh, wetlands and rivers and streams and swamps and bogs and ponds and stormwater associated with that. And the concern for the their jurisdiction on the steep slopes and hilltops is nothing more, nothing less than the other half of the town that they don't have concern about. Sheffield has an extraordinary amount of wetlands and river fronts and buffer zones and floodplains and swamps and bogs. Uh, you've heard about a bunch of them and you know them personally, I'm sure. You also have around you some wonderful big steep slopes and the Conservation Commission is logically the, the body to do that, and that's why the statute was written that way, so that the Commission could be the body to conduct pre-construction review and conditioning. The paperwork system that is used to administer the Scenic Mountains Act is a direct steal from the Wetlands Protection Act paper. The terminology of what forms are and the application process and the hearing process is exactly the same as in the Wetlands Protection Act. And uh, the um, recording of decisions and the administration of things going forward and the enforcement of violations and all of that. All of those things are very similar, if not identical, between the Wetlands Protection Act and the Scenic Mountains Act. Uh, so while it sounds like it's something new that is going to be implemented here in Sheffield, it's new because it covers a different part of town. But the philosophy and the rules themselves and the way it's implemented and administered and enforced is very familiar if you know anything about the Weapons Protection Act that you've seen for 50 years. Um, I would rather not try to dive into particular detail um, about the process of implementing, although I will talk, I, there is something I do want, point I want to make. If you are a landowner here in Sheffield, particularly if you're a landowner that owns these steep slopes and hilltops, 
Um, there is a way of defining what it is that's regulated and where it is that is very user friendly. We invented it. We, when I was chairman in Stockbridge, we were the first town to implement this in the, in the whole county. This was the first time it was ever done. And we held public meetings and public meetings on and on and on. And one of the things, it was very obvious that one of the problems was that when you require people to uh, conserve and be careful about wetlands or steep slopes and hilltops, somebody has some licensed authority, some uh, specialist person has to <coughs> look at that and decide where it is. Where is the edge of a wetland? Where is the mean annual high water line of the stream that runs through your property? These are things which, uh, in some cases, unfortunately, require the employment of a professional person who is trained and licensed to render those opinions. And, 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 and that's, that's that's what's so, but uh, it, it occurred to us when we were implementing this for the first time that while the Scenic Mountains Act in its draft, draft form established uh, boundary lines for the beginning of a scenic area or a steep slope or a mountain uh, as an elevation above sea level. And if not, there occasionally it, it, it might be the beginning, the edge of a roadway or something like that. But, but fundamentally, the, the beginning definition of scenic mountains was an, an elevation of, above sea level. And everything above that would be jurisdictional, would be subject to regulation. And it seemed to us that that would automatically require, keeping in mind, you all have seen a topographic map. You see what a USGS map looks like, what we call a USGS map, a topo map, with all those lines running around, give you different elevations. Uh, we may know how to read one of those maps, and we may understand what they're telling us, but to walk out in the backyard and decide just exactly where is 1,236 feet above sea level. <laughs> Not very easy to do. Uh, without hiring a professional engineer to come and find a local benchmark somewhere and then calculate the elevation of the backyard from there. Uh, so it struck that the way to define area that becomes jurisdictional, scenic mountain area, was to do it the way zoning maps are created very often, by describing a meets and bounds description uh, from using easily identifiable, apparent physical benchmarks here and there. And so you will see in some of the towns, and hopefully I will be able to convince your Conservation Commission to think in these terms as well, um, you'll find that uh, the scenic mountain area might begin uh, 800 feet from the apparent center line of such and such a road. Uh, that's the dimension which you and I, with a great big long tape measure, could find. Notice we're starting from the apparent center line of the road, and that's a carefully chosen term. We don't need an engineer to tell us where the middle of the road is. It is the apparent center line of the road. And we can tape it off, whether you have a 500 foot tape or a 300 foot tape, or I, I would encourage if you're ever going to do that, you have a long tape. Because <laughs> a short tape gets very boring. <laughs> um, but 
we could measure a thousand feet due west of the center line of apparent center line of a given road. If we just have to put on our boots and bushwhack our way through, you hold one of the end of the tape and I hold the other and we measure it off. And then when we get to the other end, we're a thousand feet or wherever we're going, we take out a little piece of that plastic tape that all the surveyors use and <laughs> tie it around the tree or whatever is out there and that's okay. And we can go back to the road and walk up the road 100 feet or 200 feet or something like that and do it all over again tie the thing around back there. We can do every bit as good a job from a regulatory perspective in terms of defining where the edge of the scenic area is without having to hire anybody. And so in, in many respects, that approach was intended to make it possible for property owners to answer a lot of questions for themselves as to whether or not First of all, they have to go talk to the Conservation Commission at all. Is, is, is it or is it not jurisdictional? Uh, and, and then secondly, uh, makes it a much more user-friendly sort of a process. That was, that was the hope. Uh, the, the whole question of, of um, stormwater management and drainage and erosion controls and all that, there is a book that was written by the Department of Environmental Conservation in the old days. Uh, it was rewritten in the 1980s uh, under contract to the Department of Environmental Protect EEP. Um, and it's, it, it's cited in the regulations in Stockbridge's regulations and Great Barrington's regulations. It's a, a standard reference work. Uh, which is erosion and sedimentation controls for urbanizing Massachusetts or some such title. Uh, and it shows all the different techniques, how to do this, that, and the other. And that book forms a volume of, of, of techniques for managing all of that stormwater kind of issue uh, in the hands of a, of a civil engineer who would be creating a plan to do that sort of work. Uh, this, this provides the guidance and it establishes common language that permit grantor, the Conservation Commission and the engineers can all speak the same language. It's very useful. Um, I think I'm gonna stop there rather than go on and on. And uh, maybe <coughs> invite Les to come back on the stage and we'll, uh, do some Q and A. I will uh, let you know that I have. I don't have a hundred copies for, for everybody in the room. Uh, I have a few. Uh, and, and I can illustrate for you uh, what a scenic mountain map looks like. This happens to be the Great Barrington map, which we created. Uh, and um, I can, I can uh, point to a given area that you know in, in uh, Great Barrington uh, to your north uh, and uh, show you where the scenic mountain area begins and ends. It's very easy. Anyway, here we go. I can't see hands. Here's one here. Okay. I'm just wondering, what is the height level that you made for your city mountain map? The height? Yes. Is where it starts. Most of these things have a height limit. Yeah. I want to read you, if you bear with me, I want to read you something. The, the regulations do not require that you start at a height. 
what the regulations say is that you start with a map when you go to, when you as a property owner are seeking a permit or trying to answer questions about what you need to get a permit to do, etc. You don't start with an elevation, you start with a map. The map, theoretically, can start at an elevation, but it doesn't have to. Because the enabling legislation says within it that if the Conservation Commission decides that an elevation lower than 1,500 feet above sea level is necessarily steep and needs to be protected, they, they, can, they can include that. And if an area above 1,500 feet above sea level is not needed to be protected because it's tabletop flat or whatever. Uh, they don't need to regulate that either. So in effect, though those ele elevations above sea level were established in the, in the act, they were immediately uh, provided that they to, to, to be um, uh, ignored, if you will. <laughs> by the commission in, in establishing the map that, that governs because all of the regulations relate to mapped scenic mountain areas. And that's where applicants, property owners, and conservation commissions, once established, that's where everybody starts. So you can actually them. write into the regs uh, areas, you can say, well, everything above this area is part of the act, but we also have certain key areas that are below that elevation that also are protected. No, the map, as I will be happy to show you, the, the map shows boundaries of the scenic mountain area, period. So you're either in it or you're not. So the scenic mountain act, I'm in, my wife and I are new uh, to Sheffield. Sure. The scenic mountain act, in spite of the fact that the land may be owned privately, designates the view as public property? No. no. Well then, what would be the objection if it weren't the view? Is it just about the water management? There are, there are two interests being served in, in general terms. Uh, one is watershed values, which are erosion control and steep, you know, steep slope runoff and all that sort of thing, and the aesthetics of the surrounding hillside. That's a public good. That but but is, even though it's, it's privately owned, the public still has a right to designate that view? Yes. The as far as in, in, in a similar fashion, this Wetlands Protection Act that we have made several references to, there is a public good that has been determined by the legislature um, and implementing regulations for preserving the quality of that water, preserving the wetlands and their habitat values. That has been considered a public good. And if you own private property, within those resource areas, those resource values, you are subject to jurisdiction by a local or a state authority. I guess my point is, is the view ever an issue? If somebody wanted to build a castle on one of these mountaintops, and it complied with water runoff and storm management, those things, it would still be subject to the public's view of that property? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Yep. But can we just add that the Scenic Mountain Act is not a prohibition, it's a condition. That's correct. And I think you made that point earlier, just yeah. to, to say that it's not, it doesn't prohibit the work, it just conditions how it's done to minimize visual impacts. Just as the Wetlands Protection Act rarely prohibits work, but it conditions how it's done. That's the right. one the, what are the, what are the if, if we got into a conversation about your castle on the hilltop, we might raise questions like what color is it? How tall are the turrets? 
Are you going to fly a flagpole off the top of it with a giant garrison sized flag? Are you going to build a moat? Etc. <laughs> <laughs> Etc. Et uh, there, there are you know variations of, of color and size and the amount of clearing that you might uh, feel you had to do in order to see a thousand miles or whatever. And that's where that's where the, the wiggle room is in all of this. Yeah. Yes, sir. What power does, or does the town have to legislate those conditions? What power does the town have to legislate those conditions? If someone wants to put a flag, can the town say, no, you cannot? Or if you want to clear cut 20 acres on the, on the slope, regard, and, and it does comply with weapons and runoff, does the town say, no, you cannot? The Scenic Mountains Act seeks to conserve the view, the look of, if you will, the forested steep slopes and hilltops. So does it then become a negotiation? With the it, it can, it can. There are aspects that are negotiable. I'll give you an example. Generally, regulations have some sort of threshold about clear cutting. If you want to clear cut an area big enough to put your house up on the hillside, it might be well less than a half an acre that you are going to clear. It might be that that was acceptable. Depending on the shape of the slope, the height of the trees around you that you're not going to cut down, etc., etc. What, what uh, regulatory teeth, what penalties do these laws provide if somebody says, the hell with this, I'm going to clear 10 acres so I have a nice view, mm -hmm. and they do it without a permit in a critical area. And yeah. this apparently has happened recently in Sheffield, I, I was advised, uh, yeah. by the Nature Conservancy. I, 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 I'm aware that it has happened in... And, and, but what, what, it, what is the penalty? Is there a monetary fine? Uh, it, it, does the law say, okay, you got to uh, replant those 10 acres you just cleared for your horse pasture? Uh, if, if, you're, if you're within a scenic mountain area mm -hmm. and you have cleared some excessive amount, substantial amount of land, clear cut, right, without a permit, you are in violation of a state law. What's the penalty? Jail. It depends. It could be. It could be uh, many thousands of dollars. I've seen. I've seen cases. I know of one in Monterey that I think it was forty thousand dollars. I, 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 I can tell you that under the that under the Wetlands Protection Act, the biggest the biggest the biggest penalty I, I have ever heard of, and Les probably knows it more than this, but um, there was a guy in Lenox years and years ago who didn't like the fact that the beavers had dammed up a pond and created all this wetland and all that sort of stuff. And he went, he blew out the, without a permit, went and blew down the, the, the dam, flooded the neighborhood, did whatever, whatever the end result was. I, I think he, could, he ended up with a total penalty of somewhere in the neighborhood of $40,000 too. I mean, the town does want to deal with view, uh, of, you know, concepts. Uh, back in 1980, 96, help me, Kathy, 06, when we did our master, our town master plan, it was agreed by the town residents at that time that view sheds are important and, and are to be respected. Again, not saying you can't do this or that, but we want to be careful how we go about doing it. You know, so, um, what a sort of. In line, the, the, the gentleman who talked about wanting to build a castle, uh, if, if the, the situation is that if your real estate broker doesn't tell you 
that the land that you want to buy way up on the top of the mountain has to go through regulations and town or, you know, and then that's a problem. The, the real estate broker, both in wetlands and in the scenic mountain, should be informing people before they buy a piece of property what the parameters might be in what they want to do. Chef, I have a question. If a town, I think I understood this paper that was handed out to say that um, Sheffield has adopted the Scenic Mountain Act, but has not passed regulations. So what is the impact of the Scenic Mountain Act in the absence of regulations? None. Okay. <laughs> so does, does a realtor have to say something if there are no regulations that would determine? I have an interest in that question because we dealt with this in Mount Washington. You, you gave us a huge amount of uh, support in passing the, enacting the Scenic Mountain Act. We then worked on the regulations, but right. there was an e a period in there where we didn't have the regulations and we were worried about how we could use it. Sounds like we wouldn't be able to. Yeah, well, without regulations, um, you don't have, it's, it's, like, it's like getting in the car and going on a road trip without any maps or a GPS. Or without any gas. <laughs> I just want to say that we, uh, it's been a long time, but the Conservation Commission has decided, and we have a draft right now for the Scenic Mountain Act, and we encourage anybody who lives in Sheffield, you know, to give input into that. I, I have one quick question for Chef. Yeah. So, um, if, if there's an application regarding the Scenic Mountain Act, before the Conservation Commission, uh, and it's appeal. Where does that appeal go? Ah, the appeal authority, uh, um, just for everybody's benefit, where we have state laws that are reduced to regulations which are administered and enforced by a local board, and, and the Scenic Mountains Act is, and the Wetlands Protection Act are both like that. There, if there is an appeal, if you don't like the decision that is rendered, there is an appeal process that is set up. Well, initially, I mean, it is, it's just part of the paperwork, part of the process. Uh, for the Wetlands Protection Act, the appeal authority is the DEP, the Department of Environmental Protection. For the Sea Mountains Act, the appeal authority is DCR, the Division of Conservation and Recreation. Um, used to be old forests and parks, but it's, 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 it's the parts of the state government change their names every now and then, but DCR is the appeal authority. Okay, so part of my, my point in just kind of getting, being a little bit reiterative, if the decision of the Great Barrier, or the Sheffield if you adopt the regulation. If there's an appeal, in the wetlands regs, it can be the landowner or it can be 10 citizens withstanding. But if that appeal then goes to the DEP, then there's a state action that's involved, a state regulatory action. Mm -hmm. So just reminding what I said before, you know, if there's an appeal of that, then that will trigger what we referred to previously as a MEPA review, Massachusetts Environmental Policy Act because it's within an ACEC, it, even if it's a single, it, uh, it, interesting, if it's, if it's a single family owner, that might be exempt from NEPA review. But again, uh, generally speaking, if it's not simply a single family, it would trigger a NEPA review and a wider review of what the impacts are proposed and how they're going to be minimized or mitigated. But the, the process of a review, of a state level review, uh, is is baked into the state legislation, the, the regulations, and and the state law. Uh, and there's, I mean, there's a whole hierarchy of reviews and superseding conditions and issues and permits 
being issued superseding permits and uh, appeal authority. There's appeals to appeals. It, it goes on up to um, a appeal board, which is exists only to deal with appeals. Maybe the last couple couple questions, and then uh, Leslie and Chef will be available afterwards. Yeah, good. I just want to say um, we are new here. I'm married to the cast of that. Um, but um, <laughs> when we part of why we decided to move here is because of the beautiful part of the country that this is, and we're very much in tune with the need to preserve and protect um, what it is, so the um, you know animals and plants looking on a mountain and seeing trees as opposed to large castle structures is very much in what our preference is and why we chose to be here. So I'm grateful to everyone and all of their efforts up to this time, yours in particular, and I'm sure Bruce's as well. And we're very eager to be a part of continuing to check the, the magnificence and loveliness of this part of this Jesus. Give that lady a hand. Um, at, the, at the risk of you saying no, let's try one. I have I have some property in Great Barrington. Go to Great Barrington for a minute. I have some property in Great Barrington. We all know where Butternut Sea area is, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a little hill, the Route 23 cuts Butternut on the right, as you go going to the right, and a hill on the left. I have some property on the top of the hill. Chef, if I wanted to build, let's say, a cabin, 10 by 10 uh, in square footage, and, and maybe a 10 foot, 12 foot roof line, ridge line, and I'd like to somehow get a some sort of road in, to it. Um, we'll ignore curb cuts and so on for a minute, right? I'd like to get some sort of road to it uh, up top. What would I do to explore that or to apply for that? You would probably come, first thing you would do would be, if you're talking about Great Barrington, are you? Yeah, okay. What you, what you would be smart to do would be, you grab the phone and call me. <laughs> <laughs> Number one. <laughs> okay. uh, uh, there are varying degrees of answers to questions, you know, you realize that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it, eventually, if you, if you close in on what you really think you want to do, uh, and you want to get an official answer, you might file the short form, which would be a request for determination. But what that is, is a fancy regulatory way of asking an official question. But it's inexpensive, and it's only a simple little three or four page form. Uh, you're requesting the Conservation Commission to make a determination whether what you want to do is okay, or whether you have to file a fancier form. Uh, and probably 75 or 80 percent of matters that the Conservation Commission deals with, whether they're scenic mountain or wetlands things, are handled in that sort of a paperwork fashion, which is a simple, uh, de the commission deliberates and gives you an answer, whether yeah, you're fine, go ahead, or no, um, we got a couple of issues we got to talk about, and maybe you need to file a fancier form. Thank you. All right, thank you to Leslie.